there's a field on a fine summer night if you sit all alone with the weeds or a succulent all right uh, good afternoon welcome i guess to the first ever kitchen table on WERS. I'm Phil Jones, I'm the host of Standing Room Only, and it's my honor to get to host and program the show every single week. It's the longest running show on WERS, and the only listener-supported musical theater broadcast in the country, so far as we can tell. I'm really, really glad you're here. I hope you've enjoyed the first morning of the Kitchen Kick Line. We wish the circumstances were different, but it's been so cool to get to have some live theater recorded from actors and artists' homes. This has been really excellent so far. Um, so the Kitchen Table, this is a chance to share some knowledge and catch up with some of the movers and shakers in the Boston theater community. Just some, not all, it would be impossible to speak to everyone, um, but some of the people who've collaborated on the Kitchen Kick Line. Are, are here. We're going to talk about what the heck is next for theater in Boston after a crazy year. And I want to start by welcoming and thanking again our moderator for today, uh, my colleague and new friend Annie Levy, who's the artistic director of Emerson Stage. Thanks again, Annie, and welcome. Good morning, Phil. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this uh, really important conversation that we're going to have, uh, a check-in, as it were, of where we are. Uh, how we got here and what we're looking forward to in the future. So indeed today we're going to be jumping around in time a little bit. First, talking about where we are right now as an opportunity to share out what our falls look like at our respective theaters. So I want to start by first throwing it over to Michael Bobbitt, the Artistic Director at New Rep. And Michael, I want you to invite, invite you to just tell us a little bit about what fall looks like over at New Rep. Sure. Thank you so much, Annie Levy. Um, and also, thank you, WERS, because a world with more musicals is just a better world. So more musicals, more musicals. Um, so we have a few things happening. Our first big project opening this Friday is our Watertown Historical Moving Plays. It'll be a series of plays featuring um, people that were born in Watertown. Um, the first one that we have commissioned, we've commissioned Ken Green um, to write a play about Charles W. Lennox, who uh, was a black barber who was born in Watertown. Uh, he also enlisted uh, in the Civil War uh, and fought in that uh, regiment that was made famous by, uh, in the movie Glory, the Academy Award winning movie Glory starring uh, uh, Denzel Washington. Uh, so that's a, a moving play where people will meet at a certain spot and they will have this fantastic actor, Kadaj Bennett, um, take them around to various places in Watertown. And it's a real play. It's not like a docent led tour. It's a real play with real drama and excitement. Uh, we also have ongoing our script reading book club. So in book club format, we're sending out scripts once a month to patrons, and then we get online with a dramaturg-led uh, conversation and some interaction with our um, playwright, the dramaturg, and our guests that are joining us. It's been super informative and a lot of fun. We uh, also have uh, twice a month, I am hosting a series on our Facebook Live page called In the Wings Artist Salon, having great conversations with local um, artists. Uh, for the moment, we have been focusing on Black Lives Matter and what theater and art looks like in the, in, in the midst of the Black Lives Matter movement. And then uh, some other small things we're doing to serve our artists. We are having once a month um, an artist get together where we do everything from drag, um, karaoke, to movie night, to uh, bingo, and just sort of like showing them that we love them and care for them. And then on alternate months, we're having BIPOC affinity spaces where we are going hiking and having conversations. This Saturday, we have a uh, mindfulness and meditation person um, offering healing to our um, Black and BIPOC artists. Uh, and that's it for the moment. We, we're hoping that uh, we can launch some, a few other things come November, but right now that's what we have going on. Thanks, Michael. That's a really exciting sounding fall. Um, next, I want to pass it over to Alex Lenati, the Community Programs and Events Managers at Speakeasy Theater. Alex, welcome. What does the fall look like at Speakeasy? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me here today. It's uh, Standing Room Only holds a very soft spot in my heart and I'm happy to be back. Um, so yes, Speakeasy Stage Company is ultimately a, a theater company that produces live theater. So this has been difficult. Um, 
But the crux of our mission is creating conversations. And so even though we aren't able to do that live in a theater altogether right now, we are still finding many opportunities to engage with our community virtually, which has been an exciting challenge, but uh, very, very rewarding so far. It is actually our 30th anniversary season, uh, an unconventional way to celebrate this milestone for sure, but we have an entire fall of virtual programming planned, including a September Madness event, which has continued into October, uh, where vo folks are voting on uh, their favorite past speakeasy plays. And we have a huge anniversary benefit concert planned in mid-November. We also have a ton of new virtual programming, which I'm very excited about. Uh, since May, we have been doing a weekly play discussion club. We're currently in series four, a spotlight on Latinx voices hosted by Boston playwright Alexis Shear. Um, and then in just a few weeks, series five begins, and that one is called Honoring Asian Diaspora Storytelling, and will be hosted by Micah Rosengrant. So we are doing a, a, a lot of reading plays, meeting weekly to discuss them, um, bringing in the playwrights, and it's been fantastic. We also just kicked off uh, a new program called Speakeasy University, which is a, um, a professional development seminar series specifically for students or, or those early in their artistic careers, but open to anybody who is interested in learning more about the theater industry and all of the different pockets of it. Uh, every week we're meeting Tuesdays at five for a, a seminar and then a forum with Boston professionals and the entire series is pay what you can. And then finally this summer we, we published our first ever podcast, the Boston Project podcast. We have an, a completely audio play version of The Usual Unusual by MJ Halberstadt which we developed through our program, The Boston Project, over the last two years. And then we had very talented artists all over the country uh, recording it virtually. So that is available now on every platform that you listen to podcasts on. So we're, we're pretty busy. Uh, and, and while we are eager to get back into the theater, we're going to wait to do so until it's perfectly safe. And until then, we're engaging with our audiences best we can. Thank you for uh, that very thorough overview. What an exciting fall you all are having. Um, let's, let's keep the momentum going, shall we? I wanna pass this over to Moonbox and to producer, artistic director, Sharman Altshuler. What does your fall look like over at Moonbox? Oh, you're muted. There we go. Muted. Um, yes, thank you so much. And thanks, WRS. Uh, this is amazing. Um, yeah, our fall, I mean, we are dormant as far as, you know, public performances go, but we are very active um, behind the scenes. Um, we have a project going on since the summer called the Homebrew Project, which is a way to help support our local artists. We compensate um, artists in the local area to produce short videos that we share on social media and give them an opportunity also to um, ask for donations through that uh, medium. So it's a way to keep the juices flowing and to, you know, help out a little bit um, on the financial side of things. Um, but our uh -oh, it seems works like project. Oh, you got me? Did you lose me? Sorry about that. Um, we've, uh, yeah, my internet's a little weird. I'm up in Vermont. Um, we are doing a new works project, which uh, is involving um, reaching out to the community broadly to um, get uh, proposals for new stageable um, performances. And that's sort of trying to keep the definition broad. And we've gotten, a, I think, at least 40 or 50 proposals, which we are now vetting with a fabulous panel of artists, theater professionals from the area. Um, and the hope is to um, select a small number from that to workshop them during this time that we're down and then to actually uh, celebrate the end of COVID by having a new works festival, again, when it's safe to really go to theaters, but to um, have a new works festival in Boston uh, to premiere all of these works. So that's been super exciting. Um, and the other project really has been this sort of forced introspection, but we're really taking the time to 
you know, turn the lens inward and to think about, you know, where we've been, the things that we've done well, but also how can we do those things better and to really take time to participate in some of the amazing opportunities that um, uh, Dawn and Michael have been, you know, giving everybody during this time and others to really think about how do we move into the future and be better at what we do and better community members, better employers and so on. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is both a time to be active and a time to be reflective. Yeah. Uh, along the same lines, I'm going to pass it over to my colleagues at Voices of Hope. Uh, Greg Chastain, President and Dana Siegel, Executive Artistic Director. Uh, what can you share about what's happening at Voices at Hope this fall? Well, thank you. Thank you, WRS, for uh, holding this and inviting us to be with these amazing uh, professional theaters throughout Boston. Uh, we feel very honored. Um, I'm actually going to let my artistic Executive Artistic Director, Dana Siegel, discuss uh, What's coming up for us? Hey, thank you, Greg, and thank you all for inviting us to be part of this exciting discussion. Um, like so many of our colleagues, we um, are finding it necessary uh, to find new ways to express our art and to, to lift our membership and to find ways to be engaged in the community. Uh, for us, particularly, the the um, we have a very different um, financial picture. We're not trying to support employees uh, as so many of our peers are, but we are certainly trying to maintain a presence in the community in order to continue um, our dedication to the donations that we make to the Mass General Hospital. So a lot of our focus right now is mostly visibility for ourselves and how can we remain present in the community, keep our members engaged, feel connected to our mission, uh, and be prepared for a time in which we can return to the stage. We too, like so many of you, um, are committed to not returning to the live stage uh, until we find it safe and whole. And for us, that's a complicated process. Our core membership is over 100. Our average cast is anywhere from 75 to 110. So our sheer numbers prevent us from full performances in every way. That said, we're finding new ways. Uh, like so many of you, we're exploring the virtual world. Uh, we're very excited to say that we're developing a new personality, if you will, that we're sort of naming VOH on air. Um, we spent the summer with a lot of our members contributing individual musical performances from home that we compiled um, into concerts for the patients at Mass General, who at the time of the winter, I mean, the summer months were not even able to have family with them while they were having their treatments. Um, but through that, we learned a lot of new skills for performing. So what we're doing now is actually moving into the world of radio. And our first fall production uh, will be Arsenic and Old Lace. We plan to present that over the Halloween weekend. We are so blessed that local radio personalities, Jordan Rich and Candy O'Terry, are both helping us learn new skills. Candy's doing some voiceover work for us, and Jordan's helping us with our post-production work. So it's exciting, and if it works, then we think that we'll turn a lot of our theatrical energies to on-air performances. Because we are voices of hope and the majority of our passion is music, we're also adding to our radio show um, old-fashioned jingles, some new ones written just for us, and a way to be sure that we involve our vocalists as well. Uh, following that, um, we do plan to have an, um, a virtual Christmas or holiday concert. Um, we hope to do some of that recording in person. We were blessed with a grant um, from one of our funders to allow us to buy some equipment to make our, our performance space a little bit safer. We've been able to build some recording stations that are COVID friendly so that we can have a small number of artists in the studio at any given time. We'll need to layer heavily to get the big sound <laughs> that we're used to for VOH, but we're excited about the opportunities and learning new skills. And perhaps when we return to the stage, as we hope to, um, our home is, as many of you might know, is the North Shore Music Theater, um, where we perform regularly and we miss our North Shore family deeply as we know they miss us, but um, perhaps, keeping an online or virtual voice will be a new way for us to expand our visibility in a larger arena um, and perhaps engage others in thinking about, you know, using the arts as a philanthropic way to support fundraising for organizations. So the silver lining perhaps for us. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Dana and Greg. Yeah, something that I hope that we'll be able to talk about in a little bit, or what are some of the lessons that we're learning from this um, uh, forced experience that we can take into the future. Uh, now I want to turn it over to uh, Keith Orr over at Wheelock Family Theatre. What's happening over at Wheelock during this um, most uh, unconventional fall? <laughs> most unconventional may, might be the perfect way to describe it. Thank you so much and thanks to Phil and everybody at ERS for having us. We, we, we miss being with you in the studio, uh, but we look forward to returning as soon as possible. Um, we've got an interesting fall ahead. As, as many know, Wheelock Family Theater, a majority of the audiences that we serve are public school audiences. We normally see between 12 and 18,000 students a year that come to theater programs with us who very often are seeing theater for the first time. Obviously, with the way schools are structured now, we know that field trips will not be taking place. And obviously, we couldn't invite folks into the theater at this point as well. What we are going to do, though, is continue work on a project that we've um, commissioned with uh, another theater company in Maryland uh, based on Robert McCluskey's Make Way for Ducklings. Uh, we're going to start workshopping that. And we'll be working along with the Boston University College of Fine Arts School of Theater. We have a number of undergraduate and graduate students who are going to be part of the school this year. Uh, that'll be, this will be part of their full semester project for the fall. Uh, so it's a new musical and we're excited about that. And then my colleagues in the education side of things spent an incredible summer working diligently to keep engaged with uh, all of the kids that we normally would have seen over our summer camp program to keep them active and involved uh, and are in the process of just putting the final touches on some remote learning classes that we're going to roll out in the next couple of weeks uh, so that we can continue to engage with folks uh, around that. So we're excited about some of the projects and like everyone else on this call today, uh, really looking forward to the ability to seeing everyone's face in the theater again uh, when we can do that uh, safely and properly. Thank you so much, Keith. Uh, it's very tricky to negotiate how to make theater when so much of what we're making theater for is for a younger audience that is having its own negotiations in this strange time. Um, next, I wanna throw it over to Don Simmons, who is here wearing two hats actually, but first I'm gonna throw it to Don to talk a little bit about what fall looks like for Front Porch, and then a little later on, we'll talk about fall and stage source. Sure. Um, so the front porch, we're in a little different position than a lot of folks out here. Um, uh, most of our productions have been co-productions. Um, so we're in a really fortunate position that we can all we can kind of take this moment to work on ourselves. So for us right now, the fall, a lot of what the fall looks like for us is strategic planning. Um, how do we move out of this place of doing completely co-productions and how can we get ourselves to a place where we are producing ourselves and producing in the communities that we actually want to serve. Right now we're on all of these great Boston stages and we're working with some of the finest talent. Um, but I think we also want to take those people and those opportunities and move them to places like the Strand and like Hibernian Hall. So looking at what that is, but also making ourselves sustainable. We are an organization of about six artists, all of us who are linked to other organizations or universities or independent artists. So how do we get ourselves to a place where this can be the main focus? Um, right, like the time is now and we are at least today, I think one of maybe two or three black theater companies in Boston, like run by and producing that work. So how do we get ourselves to a place where um, it, it is financially sustainable? Um, so that's, that's a little bit of what we're looking at right now, our strategic planning, um, getting our nonprofit status and sort of being able to move on our own. What I will say is that it has also allowed us this really incredible opportunity to not just do that, but to do a couple of one-off productions. So this summer, um, we worked, well, I shouldn't say productions, but let's call them events or um, other things in this time when we don't know what anything is anymore. Um, so we were able to partner with Commonwealth Shakespeare Company on an incredible week-long intensive looking at text-based theater. Um, and comparing the works of William Shakespeare with August Wilson. And how do, um, how do folks who are part of the BIPOC community actually tackle that work in ways that are not sort of set up in um, systems of supremacy or dominant culture? How do we bring our own flavor to that work um, and make it authentic, uh, but also give the same sort of value to our work as you would a Shakespeare? We have also been able to um, produce at Starlight Stage in Cambridge. Um, 
my partner and just uh, amazing human being, Maurice Emanuel Parent, helped put together a cabaret series at Starlight Stage. We did, I believe, four days. One of them was rained out, so we had to backtrack on another day, um, presenting some of our favorite artists um, to sing and tell stories, but like specifically their stories, right? To sort of tell what is your story in this moment? Um, how are you handling the pandemic? How are you handling um, the, right, I'm saying it with a smile and I don't mean to, but how are you handling the systemic killing of our people right now? What is your response to this moment? And, and giving them an opportunity to, to speak um, and to speak through music. And that one of the things that I really love about this piece that we've done is that these artists own their work, right? They did it with us and in conjunction with us, but they own these stories, they own this particular piece and they can go out anywhere and sort of move that around, um, which is really great. Cause I think that's, again, how are we providing employment? How are we providing jobs? And then uh, like everyone else, we are, we're also working on devising a piece that hopefully will live both in the digital and live realms and sort of trying to figure out what are the different things, how to, how to make this work and how to make it exciting as everybody is, um, but also what is that component that the minute we can get back on stage safely and gather in public, um, I should also say, whether it's on stage or in someone's home or in a yard, right? Like these are all the things that we're considering in this moment of how are we looking at the new paradigm? Whatever this next phase is for us, trying to create art that's responsive to both um, and can live in a lot of places. So that's, that's what we're doing right now. Thank you. That's terrific. And it's a great reminder that we're in a moment where we get to completely rethink every system that we have uh, taken as the status quo. It's a, it's a scary time. It's a hard time. It's an exciting time. Thank you, Don. Um, next, I want to throw it over to uh, Waylon Sims at Greater Boston Stage. Waylon, what can you tell us about uh, what your company is doing this um, exciting fall? Thanks, Annie. And thanks, WERS, for doing this. Kind of, it's great to hear Don talk about strategic planning because they're a new company and we're 20 years old and we're doing the same thing. We're realizing this is an opportunity to say, what have we been doing for 20 years? Are we on the right path? And this pandemic is, is making, I think all of us, every theater, think about what the future holds. So we've been doing a lot of that, frankly, a lot of facilities um, planning as well, trying to anticipate what's the future gonna look like in, in our building, um, while at the same time, doing some virtual programming as well. We're doing a wonderful Zoom play by Christine Toy Johnson called Empress May Lee Lotus Blossom that we're really excited by. We've just announced a slate of fall, mostly virtual uh, classes, but we are actually doing our first outside in-person dance classes. So that's something that we're kind of curious to see how it goes. And while we're not announcing it yet, we are exploring some outside um, performance opportunities, which, you know, kind of tagging on to what Dana said, we think that if we can make this happen, we found a great space right near our theater that could work. And if it happens, it seems like this could be something that we do for years and years to come. And a another thing that one of the few things coming out of this pandemic that may change how we do business in this really exciting new way. Um, and that that's, it's nice to have some positive things come out of all this difficulty. You know, we have a pretty extensive education program and outdoor performances for that could be something really great. So um, that's what we're up to. We have a few other things in the works that we're not quite ready to announce yet. Like everyone, it kind of feels like we went a little dormant over the summer and now it feels like we're starting to spread our wings again and explore what this new world is of radio plays and virtual plays and, and possibly live outside performances. Right. Everything's a question. Everything's a possibility right now. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. And to round, uh, to round out this conversation of what is fall, I want to throw it over to my colleague, David Dower, the Artistic Director of Arts Emerson, to tell us a little bit about what fall looks like at Arts Emerson. You're muted, David. Yeah, <laughs> thank you for having me. Uh, we've thrown ourselves into um, what we're calling a year of experimentation. You know, our um, 
our mission is connection across difference and we do that through international presenting and so it's actually been a fairly direct pivot uh, because this medium um, allows uh, continued connection even in the face of a pandemic and so trying to develop this medium as a new venue uh, we we operate out of four venues in downtown um, and now this fifth venue as um, has come online which is the together apart venue this digital venue uh, and so we've uh, created and now launched the virtual streaming room that um, we've added so that unites both our live performance and our um, long history with uh, cinematic uh, programming. Uh, so you could have seen uh, just now you would have seen uh, Step Africa's uh, premier uh, work Stono, which was about the Stono Rebellion, um, followed by um, Our Time Machines, which is a documentary film. Uh, we're going next to a, a live party, the uh, World Alive event uh, comes up uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, we'll be outdoors at uh, the Starlight with Mr. Joy. And, and we've also been able to capture Mr. Joy uh, with Daniel Beatty performing the role for Emerson, incoming Emerson students, and then it will go to uh, the Metco schools and Boston Public Schools um, during the school year as a as a, the virtual tour. Uh, we've done it every year live, but we can't do it live this year, so it's going uh, via uh, that platform. Um, so we're going to continue on the uh, the Together Apart venue. We're going to continue that mix of conversation, film live performance, um, and then uh, we do a regular series of town halls between myself and, and executive director David House, uh, just to, to be uh, kind of move transparently through this whole process with our audience and our community. So that's, you'll see that on that um, venue all fall. And then at the same time, we've been uh, fortunate enough to be able to invest in a, um, a significant series of artist residencies with international artists from around the world. So we're working on supporting the development of new work for whenever we get to come back and present it live in Boston. In the meanwhile, people, we're supporting the artists in their studios and we are um, providing access for uh, Boston audiences to the uh, development process for artists everywhere from, from Chile to Iran to um, Russia to the US um, and uh, and right here in Boston. So uh, so it's a very active fall um, and uh, we're excited to have um, you know, had an opportunity uh, to experiment with all these things, primarily by following artists who are the best experimenters. Indeed, here, here. Thank you so much, David. Um, as we round up thinking a little bit about the fall, I just want to add uh, over at Emerson Stage, where we are training for the next generation of theater makers, uh, we have also fully pivoted and committed to producing our fall season, which had been selected and decided on um, back a million years ago at the end of 2019. And we've moved all four of those performances online, including we weren't able to, uh, we're not able to produce our fall musical that we originally planned. So we're actually partnering with uh, Live and in Color, a theater company based in New York that's committed to amplifying the work of BIPOC artists. And we've commissioned a brand new musical that is looking at what the golden rule means in this moment. So more information about that will be shared out soon, but it's very excited to be um, experimenting along with everyone else and introducing this experiment with uh, the students who will take it over some point in the future. So for anybody watching and for anybody listening, I hope that this past conversation has let you know that if you think that Boston theater is lying dormant through all of this, well, that is not exactly the case. And so there's a lot of work to check out and a lot of work to support. Now I want to change directions to uh, share out a little bit the conversation of how we got here. So what I want to do now is I want to invite um, all the leaders gathered on this call to think back to the spring and the summer and think back to uh, whatever conversation, whatever process you and your theater company went through in order to arrive at this moment of what it is that um, your theater company is doing moving forward through this extraordinary fall. I first want to throw it over to Don Simmons, uh, wearing her executive director of Stage Source, uh, to tell us a little bit about, about how Stage Source has been um, helping support community conversations through almost since uh, the lockdown began. Don? Sure. Um, so for those of you watching that are not familiar with Stage Source, we're a member service organization focused on workforce development and sector improvement in the New England theater community. 
So meaning we put people in the direct path of employment um, in the theater community. And then we look at sort of what we're doing as a sector and we try to figure out how to, how to make things better, how to make our working environments better, um, how to make things more equitable um, and just trying to make this place a, a joyful place to work. Um, one of the things I always tell this story, it was like, the beginning of the week right before the pandemic, like right before everything closed down and stage horse, we're having our board meeting and the board chair uh, says to me, I think we should just talk about this really quick during the board meeting. It looks like it's a big thing. And I, I don't know, I just think we should, and everybody had been sending out there like, um, keep calm and wash your hands. Like, this is how you take care of yourselves in this moment. I'm like, it's a cold, it's gonna blow over. What do you, please. But we take some time and we talk about it. And I kid you not, like five days later, boom, everything's like just gone. Um, and so within that like next week, immediately we started getting questions about, I have this contract, what is force majeure? What, what are these terms I don't understand, um, right? Can I, can I still get paid? What do I do as a venue? Like all of these questions started coming in and one of our members, um, and it was mostly, right, it, it was a combination I would say of theater organizations and, and individuals who were just like for the first time confronted with a thing which Here's the thing I'm always gonna to say to you, I will say to everyone, and I know my friends at Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts will say the same thing, read your contract. And if you do not understand the language in it, find somebody and find out. It, just so many people impacted right away. So as we start to have, as we're starting to have all of these conversations and I'm on the phone and on emails, one of our members says it would be really great if like for the next couple of weeks, we could just have some kind of check-in, some kind of like video call where we all just get on and talk about what's going on. Um, and I also recognize that like all of us are having all of these conversations in our other pockets. So really quickly, like on a Google Hangout without like before Zoom became this thing that we are now ah, inundated with, uh, there was just this, okay, great. Hey, everybody, we're going to get on a call. I've got these folks from Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts. I've got a bunch of other people who are looking at uh, their contracts right now, who are looking at their budgets. Scenario planning was also the big thing that we heard for like the first few weeks. Like, what do we do if this lasts for a month? What do we do if this lasts for two months? <laughs> um, and how are we all sort of tackling that? So the idea of, okay, great, we can get volunteer lawyers for the arts. Let's get a couple of the organizations that I know who have looked at their budgets, who are already doing scenario planning, and let's start, let's just start talking about it. Um, and from there, we started to have conversations about how are you talking about messaging? How are you fundraising at such a odd and critical time when people are trying to figure out where's the most important place to put their money, um, but we are also in need and really starting to try to push this conversation that we are part of the creative economy. We are part of the gig economy. We employ people. Like this is a sector that needs to be paid attention to. And then working with our other art service organizations to talk about, well, then how do we get that message out? And what is the greater advocacy that we need to be doing? Um, but at the same time, all of these other sort of conversations and like, right, my, uh, my Biffle Forever, Michael Bobbitt's on this call, who also has started like an AD call with like all of the folks in this community to also say like, what what are we talking about? Um, what do we need right now? And then of course, right, um, in June, um, after the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmed Aubrey, and that's just the start, right? There was this cry for, well, now what are we doing in terms of our, our social justice, in terms of racial equity? How are we tackling that on top of this? And us trying to navigate the conversation of these two things are interwoven. Right. And how do we tease that out for the community and how do we bring this community together to do better. So right, like just everything keeps coming. But I think these phone calls, these zoom calls that we've been doing now, um, since like this, since the second week, I think our first one was March 15th. Um, we've been trying to put people in the room and helping connect everyone and tying threads together so with all of these other like micro conversations that are happening in all of these different pockets then saying well hey here's a group uh cultural salvation what are you talking about you need to be talking to the ad's about this we need to be talking to the art service organizations and the city of boston has a regular call on fridays as well 
how are we bringing all of these things together so that everybody has the most information possible to make the most informed decisions that they can. Um, and in that networking piece, which is, I think, part of what we do, um, what, a lot of what I'm seeing is the thing that we all do in the chat. Hey, I've never met you before. I really liked what you had to say. Can I get like 10 minutes of your time to talk through something. And we're seeing collaboration and partnership and thought partnership being born out of that. Um, so that's, that's a little where we've been. And what I will say, like navigating that conversation in the beginning that was contracts, scenario planning, planning, disaster planning has now moved into season planning. What does it look like? What's our digital world look like? How are we creating art? Which are some of my favorite conversations and we've only been able to have two, um, but that like, what does art look like? Getting back to the thing that we do has been really encouraging. Um, so that's a little where we started with everything. Thank you so much, Don. It's so important to sort of fill everybody in on uh, what's been happening behind the scenes and also just to highlight this opportunity to um, either strengthen or create connections between the different entities that make art in Boston and the greater Boston area. And um, it's so wonderful that this community is, is um, continuing to strengthen through all of this. Now, um, speaking, let, let's hear a little bit from Arts Emerson about what their process was about arriving at this moment, whatever they want to share about the, uh, the spring and summer that brought us to fall. David? Yeah, <laughs> some of you have heard the story. It's actually a, a really great story and quite a learning thing for us. Uh, you know, when this happened, we had a show on stage from Chile and we had uh, Toshi Regan, Parable of the Sower, on its way uh, to Boston. And uh, because we follow the artists and we're, you know, we, we sort of listen to and, and prioritize what do the artists need right now. Um, as it was happening, the Chileans were arriving. They had, their um, Hong Kong event had been canceled. So they, because it was already a problem there. So the festival was canceled. They arrived in Nashville already on a shortened tour and they were hit by a tornado. So they lost the performances in Nashville and they kind of limped into Boston. And we were like, no, we're gonna get this run in for you. Come hell or high water, we're getting this run in for you. And uh, so we had a meeting with our staff and, and, and like on a Tuesday morning at 8.30, uh, David and and I were talking to each other, David House and I, about, yeah, we're going to get this done. We're going to let our staff know we're going to, we're here for it. We had two instincts, I did anyway, um, that did not serve me. And I think it's really important um, part of the story because I'm a, you know, 30 plus year professional in the, in the theater. And one of the things everybody on this call knows is the show must go on. Anybody who's watching this, anybody who's on this call, that's a thing you learn. And it's kind of like the postal service, you know, that is the thing we know, the show must go on. Um, and the second thing, um, and I say this, I've told the story, but I um, have a lot of years of activism uh, on many different fronts. And I was in San Francisco in the uh, middle 80s into well into the 2000s, but through the, the worst years of the AIDS pandemic. And the thing about um, standing with your community during the AIDS crisis was that touch was not going to kill me. I, I was at no risk from you if you were HIV positive. I, we could actually stand together by standing together. And the call for activists at that time was to hold each other close, like physically. I remember walking down Market Street and one of the parades was a kiss-in where all the people walking down the street just walked up and kissed the strangers on the sidewalk. Um, and that was the activism. And so I was kind of forged in this strange, um, a uh, set of instincts that had nothing to do with this moment. And we were sitting there on that Tuesday morning saying to the staff, hey, we've thought this all out. We're going to finish this run. We're going to get um, Parable of the Sower in and we're going to do X, Y, and Z thing. And the staff was looking at uh, David and I like we were, had six heads. And um, one person had the um, sort of the gumption and the, and the uh, confidence to say, no, we're not. <laughs> and uh, go back and rethink that's a bad plan. And uh, so I went right to the phone from that meeting and I called Toshi Regan to say the same thing to her, that don't worry about it, we're gonna do the show. We're committed to you, this show can come in next week, we're gonna finish it. And she said, that's great, thank you very much. And you know what, what if we didn't do the show? And I said, what do you mean? 
And she said, what if instead we listened to the show? And Parable of the Sower is about the, what happens to the planet after an environmental collapse and how community has to be created and how faith has to be recreated and how all kinds of uh, systems and, and how the, the corporatization of America had come to lead to the um, apocalypse. And so uh, she said, what if we just listen to the show and instead we learn how to stand together by standing apart? And uh, so that became the thing. We went right back into a meeting. It was only like two hours after we'd said we're going forward. We pulled everybody back into the meeting and we said, we're all going home now. <laughs> and and we'll, uh, we'll check in with you about what we're doing, but we're canceling the Chilean show the rest of the run and we are not bringing uh, um, the Parable of the Sower until we can. And that led to, all right, then in between, what are we going to be doing it? So developing this venue, uh, checking, we, and you know, doing a lot of early, the, those early days, we were calling a lot of our audience members just to make sure everybody else was okay. Um, we'd been inviting people to the theater right up until that moment, and we didn't know um, where people were. And in those phone calls, we heard from many people who said, um, you know, the digital venue that you've just created, please keep it going because just because you are ready to go back to live performance and just because the mayor or the CDC says it's fine, I'm not sure I'm gonna have the same confidence at the same time that you are. And I need this venue in order to remain connected, in order to you know, really you know, to see the world, to feel the world. That's what we were doing. That was the pr promise that we had made to our audience. And so that's what people were asking for. Please don't go away just because you can go back to the theater. And so uh, that, everything um, you know sort of emanated from that we I, I would say that the um, the racial reckoning which you know at, at, like Don uh, was saying these two things are, are really bound up I think it's all one pandemic I know that we talk a lot about it being two pandemics but the pandemic has shown us everything it's like Adrian Murray Brown says you know um, nothing is nothing is broken nothing is different just everything is being revealed it is what it's always been. It's just now being revealed. And this revelation is coming from the pandemic. All of this is coming from this, this virus. Um, and, and we were already in a place of working on a lot of these uh, things. But what did end up happening um, in, amongst our staff was that there was a request that came that we focus this full year of experimentation on anti-racist work and work that uh, teaches us to live more lightly on the planet. Um, and so everything that you're going to see um, coming out of uh, Arts Emerson, including the residencies and what's on, online, will in some way try to teach us the story of living together as one planet, more lightly with the planet, and we're developing um, both the tools and the voice of an anti-racist organization. Thank you so much, David, for taking us through that process to arrive here. And in just in, in, in hearing you uh, relive this, back in March, an invitation I want to put out to the community or a desire. I can't wait for some day in the future, it may be far in the future or near in the future, for um, stories to be dramatized of that week, that week in March when we went from um, being not knowing to knowing and all of the back and forth that happened. I want to pass it back to uh, Jerry Hammond over at Wheelock Family Theater. Jerry, is there anything that you can share with us about how Wheelock arrived at this moment? <sighs> Well, I think, you know, it's, we were about to go into, um, on the education front, March uh, vacation week programming, then April vacation week programming, spring programming, nine weeks of summer programming. And I think what was interesting is the way that it just, um, every day was a change. Um, so that whole period of time was like plan A, plan B, plan C. Um, so that it stopped in March, but I think in March we had this sense that maybe it'll be a few weeks. Maybe by the time May comes and spring comes, it'll be better, maybe by summer. And so it was this constant um, communicating with families, replanning, grieving, getting our hopes up, grieving again. You know, So I think to, it wasn't just one loss, it was this rolling loss of weeks and weeks and weeks and months and months as we began to realize that this is not going to be just a couple of weeks that we can't be together in person. Um, mm -hmm. And I think coming to the realization that, you know, as theater organizations, arts organizations, we are planners. We plan seasons way in advance. We plan 
course offerings way in advance and being able to see the blessing in the fact that that was brought to a halt. So, you know, I think the, the theme that everybody's been saying is that gave us this time without the excuse of we're too busy. We've got another show. We've got another tech week to really reflect and reflect on what our mission is and what is, you know, what does that mean? And um, every single policy, you know, um, and practice that we have. Um, and I think one of the big takeaways is for us to be able to think about what can we do in this moment and how can we serve? And I think that the group I want to just raise up is our youth, our young people who are really also really struggling during this time and need their arts and many of whom their arts artistic community is what gets them through the day is what affirms them they're not finding that in other places um when we continued with um we were trying to we were rehearsing for the drowsy chaperone 30 teens full musical when all this happened in march um and couldn't get the rights for a remote performance. We kept thinking the time will come, we can do a performance in the summer. And these kids just wanted to keep rehearsing. We said, we don't know when you can perform. They said, we want to keep rehearsing. So they rehearsed for months, a number of times a week on Zoom, while being on Zoom all day at school. And we kept saying, you, you still want to do this? Like, you must be tired of Zoom. And they said, yes, but this is the one, it's different. This is the one part of our week we look forward to. This feels like we're in the circle together. Um, so I think, I guess the lesson I would take away is that while we grieve the loss of all the things we can't do, um, doing, connecting with our young people through the arts, it, it's not nothing. It's not the same, but it matters. And that's what our kids would say matters. So that's, we're really trying to think about how we can we serve um, in a way that matters while we while we're in this period of sort of slowdown and reflection. Thank you so much for that, Jerry. Yeah, in this moment of reflection, we we think about and we recommit how we serve all of our audiences, even those who um, it is greatly difficult for them to join us at the theater under the best of circumstances. So with that in mind, I want to uh, move us on to uh, having gone from the present moment to thinking back to the past to now being um, in perhaps um, uh, in a position to think about the future, however we want to define it. Um, in thinking about the future, I want to think a little bit about um, how both our industry and our art form are going to evolve out of this moment. As, um, as Don and David already talked about, we're in a twin pandemic right now, and they, they, are, um, they are interdependent, they are one. So coming out of this, you know, how how are we dismantling uh, all of the aspects of the systems of making theater that are racist, that are inequitable? Um, and as we look to the future of our community, what are we working towards? Uh, for, first, I wanna throw it back uh, to Alex at Speakeasy Stage Company to talk a little bit about uh, what steps Speakeasy wants to be taking uh, for a better future. Absolutely, thank you very much. Uh, you know, I think that this time has taught, has, has there have been silver linings this time for all of us as we're able to uh, look inward and, and recommit ourselves as organizations to our values and to grow and learn. Uh, at Speakeasy, we're about to release our uh, anti-racism and equity action plan, which we have been working on for months now. And we're really excited by the changes that we're going to be putting forward, uh, working towards a overall just a safer, healthier, more inclusive, accessible, more complete organization in a theater industry. Um, I also think that uh, this movement, this time has taught us a lot about accessibility. Access has always been something that's very important to Speakeasy and it's something that we have been working towards in, in every aspect of what we do, but this this time has has taught us new ways to do that. I mean, with as basic as Speakeasy University, this program we've just launched, um, it will provide the skills that an internship may have provided, but to absolutely anybody who can access it through a computer. And there's there's so many 
there are so many ways that technology can can connect people who wouldn't have been able to participate before, which we're seeing on such a grand scale. And um, I, I, as a few of my colleagues here have mentioned, I think we will be using a lot of what we've learned, even when we are able to go back to quote unquote normal and produce live theater, we will continue this using technology to make the work we do more inclusive and accessible to everyone. Thank you so much for that, Alex. Um, Michael, can I throw it over to you to hear a little bit about how New Rep is thinking about the future? Yeah, and I have a bunch of opinions about sort of the nonprofit industry in general and how that model, nonprofit model, is broken and needs to be relooked at. And many of the inequities that we struggle with come from that structure. Um, uh, the other thing I will say is that as uh, programming experts, I, I also think that maybe one of the places where we might struggle is that when we look at fixing inequities, we always go to our programs first. We look at programs, we change programs, we create community engagement programs, and much of that hasn't worked to change the inequities that we still struggle with in our organizations. And, um, and, and maybe, maybe as programming experts, we need to recognize where we may have um, our own um, failings. And maybe we need to look at um, bringing in more people that can help us relook at our business models, who also can marry that with, with um, racial equity. Um, so that's what New Rep is doing. Our, um, uh, we, I, I believe crises are good opportunities to fix things that have been broken maybe for a long time. I think we've all learned that our financial models are, um, are, are trepidatious. You know, many of us that brought in all that money from subscriptions. Uh, subscriptions to me are one of the most racist things that exist in the nonprofit theater industry. Um, anyway, we are looking at um, really focusing on um, the parts of the organization that I think create the most um, racism, which is governance and operations and finances and, 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 and maybe even marketing. Um, so our race equity plan is heavily looking at um, adjusting those things. Um, and some of the, I can share with you some of the small um, policies that we're creating. We're creating 15 hours of onboarding for all board and staff. That'll be pared down to a three hour version for all artists. And hopefully we can have them do this work before they come in the building. And then a 90 minute version for, um, for our sort of ushers and such. And, and not that we can change our hearts and minds in that sort of 15, three or 90 minutes, but at least we can make it difficult for racists to be racists um, by having this training. We also are developing a racism incident report so that every moment of harm is documented. I want to be able to look at the documentation and look at the harm and reduce it every year and make people aware of that. We're separating out our racism harassment from our general harassment um, policy. Race tends to get sandwiched into other forms of discrimination. Uh, and because race is so deeply rooted in American society, it almost never gets fixed. Our race equity plan um, does not include other um, discrimination. We're gonna build those plans out separately again uh, sometimes those the intersectionality can distract people from focusing on race and race never gets fixed. I jokingly say that gluten-free people in this country have more rights than black people. And that's because it's so hard and so deeply rooted. So let's focus on race for the moment. Um, we, uh, our race equity plan has a tracking system so that we can really track what we say we're going to do. And we're going to publish those um, all the time. Um, Many things like that to really just help us um, to, to rebuild the structure. I'm hoping that I can get my board to re-looking at uh, how decisions are made, that we are still sort of using Robert's rules of order. Why aren't we using emergent strategies or some other consensus way of, of building? Um, but all that stuff, I think, is part of what, what, what New Rep is focusing on. And I'm hoping that, uh, and I'm sharing all that stuff with, with my colleagues as it comes up, because I think that the more people that adopt these kinds of systems, the better things will be. Um, programming, I think, is fairly easy. We can certainly do more shows about BIPOCs. Uh, we can certainly start developing more um, um, 
personal relationships with BIPOC communities rather than transactional relationships that things like discount tickets continue to maintain. Um, discounts to me are often a, another way to assuage white guilt. Um, so let's build relationships rather than continue to just charge them tickets, even if, if even if it's at a reduced fee. We're looking at things like um, um, general admission seating so that everyone can have a chance to sit up front. Uh, we are, our subscription model will be replaced by a um, sort of Netflix-like membership model where our, Pat uh, loyal patrons have access to everything, including seeing the show more than once if they want. Uh, and one of the big things I think this industry is way behind that we've been speaking about is streaming. I don't understand why there's still difficulty in, in, in fixing that. The idea that our show can be seen by 100,000 people versus the 5,000 that we can squeeze into our theater in the five week run, to me, it's a no brainer. Uh, and it worked for the sporting industry um, people that love theater will still come to live theater. And now people that can't come or don't feel comfortable coming, they can watch it from their living rooms. Um, so all of those things I, I, uh, frustrate me, but excite me about where we can go. And I do think that we're in a, in a place where these two pandemics are, um, are like almost perfectly timed, even with the trauma that we're suffering. Here's a chance for us to fix what has been broken for years. Um, even in our um, equity, diversity, and inclusion committee, which is another thing that we do that doesn't work. It hasn't worked. We've been doing that for 10, 15 years and we still don't see change. Uh, and so our EDI committee has a lot of power to influence a lot of change in the organization. And uh, otherwise I feel like you're relegating that committee to the kitty table at Thanksgiving. So if you're going to have that committee, give them power, give them power. Uh, I could go on and on and on, Annie, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I will. I'll let someone else have, have the mic. Thank you for sharing all that. I mean, it is, it, it is the moment of the great rethink, and we're all being challenged to be as uh, brave in our rethink as we possibly can be. So thank you for sharing all that, Michael. Um, I want to now pass it over uh, to hear a little bit about how Moonbox is thinking about the future. Sharman, can you fill us in a little bit about what the conversation in Moonbox has been? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I just want to thank so much, uh, Michael, you and Don, you for really helping so much to get this conversation going and to really, I don't know, help theater companies think about all of these things. Um, and we have, we have had the we're a small shop and so for us to kind of go dormant and to have some introspection is relatively easy we don't have a big staff we don't have real estate um and so we really spent time trying to meditate on a lot of the things going on right now um and one of the things i think that we have spent a lot of time on in the past few years and continue to do so is the question of accessibility um specifically in the area of the deaf disabled and hard of hearing um, audiences. Uh, and I think that one of the things we're really trying to do in addition to working hard on making sure our shows are deeply accessible to audiences. Um, and, and one of the ways we're trying to do that is to think about it in terms of building those processes in at day one. Um, one of the things we've heard from those uh, people in those communities is that often accessibility feels like a, an add-on, sort of an afterthought to a production, um, you know, and having ASL is great, but if it's not integrated into a show, it can feel very, you know, sideshowish, secondary in terms of uh, focus. So um, really trying to look at how do we, how do we incorporate those conversations in a day one, both in terms of budgeting, in terms of even the design of the show itself. Um, we've worked really hard in the last couple of shows with our set designers and our lighting designers from the very first meetings to say, how are we gonna work in captioning? How can we project it into the set? How can it become part of what we do? How can we think about the ASL? How do we stage that appropriately? Um, and so to really think deeply about that and to consult with members of the deaf, disabled, and hard, hard of hearing communities themselves because they have lived experiences that, you know, really shed a lot of insight into what is lacking in an accessible experience and how do we really, you know, make, 
make those communities feel a part of what we're doing and not just sort of like, oh, we have a couple of days, we're going to do ASL, you know, buy your tickets then. I think it's really important. Um, and honestly, it raises the sort of caliber and the meaning of a show, I think, when you do those things. Um, it's not just a distraction um, for the other audience members who don't need it. I think it can really make everybody's experience deeper. And I've had people come up to our staff after uh, a show where we've had projected captions or an ASL performance, and they've said, uh, and they're not hard of hearing or deaf or disabled, but they said that was such an enriching experience for me. I never have been to a show that had an ASL and I just couldn't keep my eyes off and they were amazing. So I think it's, it's a zone that is a, it's an enhancement rather than sort of an, in, you know, a duty of the industry. I think it really does raise the level of an experience. So I think it's important to think about things that way. And we continue to really try to dive deep on that. Um, but for us, um, oh, and also I think, broadening the definition of um, accessibility in terms of ASL, captioning, audio description, tactile experiences, um, sensory friendly. I mean, I know Wheelock, you've done a lot of work in this area, um, but uh, just really trying to keep the circle wide. Um, and uh, the other thing is that for us, accessibility I sort of think of it in terms of, you know, accessibility and equity, not just making a show accessible, but really trying to turn that into a, into our, into the behind the scenes activities as well, and really trying hard to bring people from the deaf, disabled, hard of hearing communities into our staff. I mean, we, there are tremendously talented people out there who are artists and actors and designers and producers and technicians who happen to be members of those communities and to make sure that our system is open to them to come in as an, as employees and to make sure that they are supported um, to be a part of our our group and to um, collaborate with us in creating art. So I think that's another important part of it. It's not just to sort of say, "Hey, come see our show," but "Hey, come work with us." You know, we want you and we want to hear your perspectives and get your talents. So um, that's one of you know many zones that we're really trying to dive deeper on, and um, and so it's you know. It is, it's, it's, it's an exciting time, it's a challenge, but it's deeply exciting. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm gonna throw it back to Don uh, in the executive director of Stage Shores Hat to talk a little bit about the future for the, the larger theater community. Um, yeah, thank you. So I just wanted to reinforce uh, a few of the things that I heard and especially in terms of accessibility and how we also rise in this moment to um, be better stewards of the disability community, right? Um, I think it was just really heartening to hear uh, Sharmi and Alex talk about it. Um, for the folks at Wheelock, like they are the pioneers in this work for um, our community. And so thank you. But th there is this, right, like while we are doing this anti-racism work, Right. What are the other communities that need to be brought up as well? And I think that disability community, um, the LGBTQIA community, right, which is just blossoming. We can't forget about all like all of the intersectionality that is happening in this moment. Um, how do we make how do we make the future better for all of us? Um, and so I think, right, Sharmi, to your point, it's not just about come to our shows, but right work with us? What are the systems that we are putting in place for these communities um, on the back end so that being a part of a production is also a pleasurable experience, is also a gainful pathway to employment and not just, right, tokenization. I don't want, and I think none of us want in this future, for it to move, like the tokenization of a of a race or an ethnicity or a group to move from like BIPOC to, and now it's here, right? Like how are we continuing to build better systems? And I think also to Michael's point, right? The, op the opportunity in this moment is not just about the transactional, right? What are we doing again on the back end in the boardroom? How are we changing the makeup of the people who are making decisions for the organization? And like that is, if we're re-looking and rethinking systems and practices, right, it, it has to be bold. It, it, it's going to be painful, right? It's gonna be uncomfortable. 
Um, but we, we should be used to that by now. We've been uh, in pain and uncomfortable, um, many of us for six months, many of us for much longer, right? Um, so now, right, when we're talking about equity, pain can be equitable too, right? Like how, how are we sort of doing that hard work um, and holding ourselves accountable? And I think like, as we look at the future, we are saying all of these things, right? We all have the best of intentions, but what's going to hold us accountable to the work that we are doing in the future, especially when the pressure is off, right? Um, my good friend, Karthik and I, everybody's my good friend. I love everyone. Um, <laughs> uh, Karthik over at Company One has been asking this question and it sits with me all the time, right? How, what happens when the pressure's off? What happens when we're a little more relaxed? Who is going to keep us driving forward? Um, and so I think a lot of this is also, how are we engaging our audiences in this work? How are we making them understand the value of it? How is it important to them? And then like, I'm gonna say it, the funding community. These priorities have to be important to them for them to continue to be important to us. Like somebody's gotta hold our feet to the fire. Otherwise it just gets easy to sort of, well, we tried. And then we wind up back in the same conversations that we were having two years ago, five years ago, and so on. Um, and I don't think anybody wants to go back. So if we're thinking about being bold and envisioning something new, it's got to be throughout the entire system. Thank you so much for that, Don. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity. I want to throw it back to David Dower to talk a little bit about how everything that has been said so far has influenced some major decisions happening over at Art, Arts Emerson. Yeah, uh, well, it, it, the timing is um, interesting because uh, the, the big decision, uh, many of you already know that I've made the decision to leave. Um, and that decision has been in the works for pretty much 18 months. And a lot of it comes from the same things, um, but it, uh, it's brought into a kind of relief or a spotlight um, as a result of the work that people are doing now around anti-racist work for the institutions and attempts to share power. But a, a couple of things that I would say quickly on this front. One, I think it's really important for our community as a group to um, be careful with our language and to claim the future. Um, we're not going back to normal. And we can't be talking about going back to normal. We will lead people right back to the old problems. So we have to be leading forward. And we're not, so we're not going backwards. We also do have to be bold. And as you said, that's going to be painful. Um, there are going to be decisions that we're all each going to have to make that are not necessarily in our best interest on the surface. They, and in order to share power, people with power are going to have to give it up. And so for and this is something that we've been working on in our institution for the last 18 months is making ready the sharing of power such that I could step away without any um, sort of wobble in, in the commitments that, that Arts Emerson has had all along in this work. Um, and uh, so I, I say it as a challenge, but also as a kind of, um, uh, I guess, learning for the group. Um, it's not something you do overnight. It's not something that you just do on your own. And then you look to see what happens. Things fall apart that way. But when you structure it and you take it on as your actual um, responsibility, not only um, an opportunity, but if we are serious and um, we're, we're serious, <laughs> Art Emerson, many people on this call are serious. Um, if we are serious, we can't paste over these things. We can't you know, use better language to get somewhere. We can't change the programming to get somewhere. We can't even change the who's sitting in the audience um, to get somewhere. We have to change the power. And um, so that uh, comes down to me. I've been on this mic for 30 years plus as a white man. And it's, you know, I've been screaming about this stuff for 30 years and it hasn't gotten any better. Here's my next move. What if I stop talking about it and just step aside? I don't know what comes next. I don't know what space I've just made. Our whole organization doesn't know what space we're making by me stepping off. But we know we're making some space and that space will make a difference. And uh, it's up to the people who are holding that space now to see what difference it makes. Um, but come January, that won't be my, um, my space. At, you know, I won't be on the mic in that way. And I, I just encourage everybody to think about what's your path, including all of you listening and the students who are just coming in, what path are you creating that actually is committed to sharing power and creating these uh, visions of accessibility and equity and all of the things that we've not done in my generation, we have not done for you. You are coming in to an industry that has not done this. And how are you stepping in 
to make sure that it's done in your time frame. I'm sorry that we didn't get it done for you, those of you who are students and who are coming in, um, but I'm, I'm counting on you and I have faith in you and I'm, um, I'm stepping aside to make space for that. Thank you so much, David. Uh, as a way to bring this conversation to a close, uh, I want to invite everyone to uh, think a little bit about this question. Um, what's the first theatrical thing you want to do or be a part of when we're able to be close to each other again? However you take that to mean, I'll give you a moment to think about it. But first I wanna throw it over to Alex who wears an additional hat and might be able to uh, tell us a little bit about um, some resources that many of us young people, uh, established artists might wanna know about for the very present moment, Alex? Thanks, Annie. So yes, I'm gonna put on a second hat um, and tell you just very briefly about the Theater Community Benevolent Fund. Uh, we're an organization that exists to provide emergency financial relief to artists in need. Uh, we've always been there for catastrophic events, a fire in your apartment, surprise dental surgery, you name it. But we've been working especially hard now during COVID-19 and we've awarded over $170,000 in emergency support. Uh, we are specifically here to help artists in times of need. And this is a huge time of need. Uh, so many people I know don't apply because they think there are others who might need it more or think that they do not qualify. So I would just like to urge everybody who is struggling to consider applying this is what we're here for. So please visit tcbf.org for more info. Thank you so much for all that, Alex. I'm sure a lot of people are really glad to know that that exists. So now as a way to bring this conversation to a close, let's think to the future, whenever that might be. What is the first uh, theatrical thing that you want to do, be a part of or experience when we are able to be close to each other again? Would anyone like to start us off? If we're worried about talking over each other, just unmute yourself and I will uh, give you the go ahead. Okay. Michael, Michael, you wanna go ahead? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, like uh, um, David's beautiful words um, are, re are reminding me that, uh, you know, if there isn't significant change, Frankly, I don't know if I want to go back or go into the theater. I just don't know if I if I have it in me. Um, so I'm 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 hopeful. Kendi says the moment you lose hope the, is the moment you seal the fate. So I'm hopeful that we can change. But if it doesn't change, I just don't know what I'll do. Thank you. Fair enough. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, I, I really look forward to being able to. Uh, be physically in space with the audience that holds that ch us accountable to that change. Because I think mm. until unless we're standing in front of them, we're not going to be able to feel the responsibility. Um, and, but once we are, we will know, our, have, what have we done? Um, and so I look forward to standing physical space with people who I've asked to hold us accountable. Thank you, David. Don? Um, I, I think I am looking for us, um, the front porch, but all of us as artists in this community to do something transformative. I'm looking at, but transformative in what is the art we are creating as a sector and putting into the world? How are we um, helping to raise the profile of New England as a sector of this city? Um, and and let's think, let's think daringly, right? Where does where does theater happen? Where does live performance happen? And how does it happen? what are we ourselves creating instead of pulling in the work of so many other folks? Like what's, what is that opportunity? I'm looking forward to us sort of dreaming big and using the artists that are here, right? Um, but as well as pulling from other communities, which is something that we don't, we don't do a lot of here. Um, so, so how do we do both of those things? How do we hold those things? Um, making our own art, pulling in really great ideas, um, but creating like, how are we, um, creating that future, how are we the example instead of sort of following everybody else's example? I think that's the opportunity right now. Thank you. Anyone else, a hope for the future when we can be close to each other again? Sharman. Yeah, I think following on what Dawn just said is I sort of, I look forward to finding a way that we redefine what theater is for the community so that we have people coming to us who never would have walked through a theater door before who just for whatever reason, whether it's financial or cultural or just, you know, logistical, 
the theater just hasn't been on the radar and to create uh, opportunities that everyone wants to join in on. And I think the outdoor performance thing is a huge opportunity where people can just walk by and join into something. I think pay what you can is great because it's just, you know, everybody does what they can, but they are all equally invited. I think that that to me is really exciting is to really broaden what does it mean to be an audience to theater? I think that it's, we've got lots of work to do there and a lot of opportunity. Yeah, ways to make this family of ours bigger, yes. Dana, what about for you? Sure. Um, because our, our membership base is slightly different, I think our first need uh, in order for us to continue to even exist is to embrace our members in very huge hugs um, when we can be physically together again. Uh, so much of our membership is built by people who've brought their art to our studio because they're grieving. They are connected. We are all connected to the cancer community. We all have individual reasons and stories that we choose to express ourselves through our music, our, our vocalists, our dancers, our orchestral folks, and, and our designers. Uh, they're either mourning a loss of which they work through because music is such a healing process, or fortunately, more and more celebrating recovery and wanting to give back to the cancer community. But our members themselves come because there is a supportive environment internally first. So in order for us to grow forward and to learn how to embrace the larger community, we need to hold up our internal community first. So there is a slightly selfish awareness there that they need some hugs and they need some support. Uh, they have lived through this. Uh, many know that our immediate community has lost members. Uh, COVID hit us very hard. Um, and so we have grieved separately um, together. Um, we need time to grieve together. Um, and from that, we do hope to learn and lift and embrace. We've been interviewing our members, asking them to help us understand what our next step is. How do we embrace not only BIPOC and disability, but all the greater communities that we need to reach. Um, we talk regularly with Mass General about the social disparities in cancer care to begin with. And we're very committed to raising our voice in that arena as well. Um, but we've got some internal healing. Again, we're not employees, we're all volunteers. Um, and we need to be sure that we shore them up so they continue to do the work that we're dedicated to. We've um, suspended fundraising pretty much this year. Our main goal has really been to provide support to our frontline workers, the healthcare workers, our teachers and so forth. But, um, but we're ready to reunite and find a new way to continue to be a voice um, for the arts as well as for healing. Thank you, Dana. Anyone else, uh, a hope for the future? Waylon, yeah. So on a kind of personal note, I wanna see the kids in our young company perform again on stage. There's nothing that kind of makes my heart feel better than that. But I also really can't wait to see in person the art that comes out of what we're all going through and that speaks to what's happening right now because that's so much a part of what we're doing. That's what our industry does and we're not able to do it live and in person right now. And that's how I think we'll begin to see as Michael and Don said, you know, if that change is happening, not just in the work, agree, but the work's part of it. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah, I uh, think, thanks. I think from Wheelock, I, I think we we echo you, Alan. It's 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 seeing seeing those students back in those seats, those you know those student matinees at ten thirty in the morning when you ask everybody to raise their hand if this is the first time they've ever been in a theater, and you see seventy five percent of the hands go up, which is pretty amazing. Um, and just to hear their reaction and their voices. And I, I won't speak to the education classes, I'll let Jerry speak to that, but just the live performance component of what we get to see uh, and those students is, uh, it may not be the first thing we can do, but it's something that I truly look forward to. Jerry, do you wanna, do you wanna share hope? Oh, um, I hope that, um, oh boy. You know, it's, it just feels so big. I mean, I hope there's the tiny moment when I just want to see those children there in the classes and the brilliance that comes out of young people collaborating through the arts together. Um, and 
in, but I, you know, also want it to be um, in every space in our theater, a place of affirmation and joy and, uh, and not harming, <laughs> not harming um, any human being. And it, what that's going to look like, I don't know. I just hold this image that, 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 that it is possible. And I think us holding each other to that, like I'm inspired by what all, all these theaters are putting out there and trying and thinking. And um, so I think trusting in that, that I, I hope we will continue to collaborate. And we will not go back to this competitive, my theater, your theater, who's, who's good at this, who's, who, you know, the best at this, that we will all stay vulnerable. We will all stay transparent. We will all continue to learn and push each other um, to have the arts do what the arts are meant to do for our humanness. Um, I guess that's it, that we don't, we don't go back to the old way in that way either that we still continue to talk with each other and push each other and think together. Thank you, Jerry. Alex? Yeah, just to, to end, I'd like to, um, to echo Jerry and then something Don said earlier that I, I truly just hope we don't lose this momentum. Um, and, and on it, what I'm excited for, uh, I'm just honestly so excited to see our speakeasy family Again, uh, we had a virtual event a couple weeks ago and seeing artists and board members and subscribers and audience members all in one space, albeit virtual, talking to each other and talking about art and theater. It was very emotional. Um, mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's what I miss the most. I miss our family. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. And as a newcomer to this community, I'm greatly looking forward to meeting many of you in person someday in the future and not just over Zoom. With that, I'd like to invite Phil Jones back into the space to wrap things up. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks again, Annie, and thank you so much, again, everybody else, all of you for bringing your time and your, your knowledge and your experience, um, your love for what we're doing to to the kitchen table today, um, both the metaphorical and in some cases the literal one. Um, before we wrap up, I did want to lift up one thing, one sort of hopeful note, remembering what David Dower said earlier about the role that theater played in the AIDS crisis. It gets different circumstances than now. It's a very different crisis, a very different moment. Um, but in the not too recent past, I think it's important to remember the vital role theater played in bringing AIDS into public consciousness and even starting to stir seeds of change. We are in a different time, we have different players, and we have very different challenges ahead of us, but in some ways, not so long ago, uh, we've been here before. And I think we're gonna have to be a vital part of changes moving forward too. It'll be exciting uh, to see what comes. Thank you so much uh, for all of your time. Break a leg with all of your virtual seasons. Um, I am just wowed by what everyone's been able to accomplish. Um, and thank you to everyone who's joined us at the kitchen table today. Uh, if you're watching it on Facebook Live, it's going to be broadcast again tomorrow morning, bright and early at 7 a.m. And we're going to continue, continue the kitchen kick line performances tomorrow at 12 o'clock with a live performance from Greater Boston Stage Company. Thanks so much. Be good to yourself. I'll see you next time. Show.